Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, the Adapt Grazing 101. This is part three, uh, the third and final part of our beginning series on adaptive grazing with Dr. Alan Williams. And tonight we'll be focusing on succeeding with the implementation of adaptive grazing principles uh, through some case studies that Dr. Williams is going to share. My name is Pete Huff. I'm the program officer for the Pasture Project. Uh, which is part of the Wallace Center. We are hosting this webinar. Uh, tonight we are honored to be joined by Dr. Alan Williams. Uh, Alan is a, uh, an expert both nationally and internationally on adaptive grazing and adaptive management practices and has been involved in the conversation and the advancement of these practices for a very long time uh, and works very hard to uh, meet and work with groups all around the country and world to help to improve in transition these practices. He himself is a sixth generation family farmer uh, in Mississippi, and he also has his academic background in animal science, both his undergraduate and graduate studies from Clemson in animal science, as well as his PhD in livestock genetics from LSU. He's a founding partner of Grassfed Insights, LLC, Soil Health Consultants, and the Soil Health Academy, providing a lot of cons consulting and education activities and opportunities uh, around the country and the world. He's a partner in Joyce Farms and is on the board of the director of the Grassfed Exchange, which is coming up here in mid-June, in case you haven't registered for that, in Rapid City, South Dakota. There's also He's also on the board of the directors for the Mississippi, Mississippi Sustainable Agriculture Network. He has been a core team member of the Pasture Project uh, for a very long time and has been a great contributor to all of our projects, including the photo that you see here, uh, standing in a field uh, last August in Illinois at one of our demonstration farms and uh, open field days and pasture walks. He's also a co-investigator -inve with Team Soil Carbon. Alan's a well-written uh, author as well as an active consultant and an active speaker at conferences and meetings, uh, like I said, around the country and around the world. So without any further uh, information from me, I will pass it off to Alan, who is going to walk us through uh, his presentation. So, Alan, I will hand over presentation to you. Pete, thank you very much, um, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, we are in the final and third segment of this series pertaining to adaptive grazing. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to try to wrap up talking about how we effectively implement adaptive grazing. And we're gonna use a number of case studies to be able to illustrate that. So we're just gonna dive right in. Study, but this is a farm that uh, my partners and I purchased uh, here in Mississippi uh, back in 2009. Uh, it adjoined other properties that made it a strategic purpose purchase. This is the condition of the farm at purchase. This was in the fall of 09. And as you can see, it, it, it was very beat up, lots of bare ground, uh, and it grew. It was growing practically every kind of weed and brush and so forth that you can imagine. The history on this, if you know a lot about the history in this area of the U.S., uh, agriculture in terms of tillage and so forth started here in the early 1800s and for 150 plus years the predominant crop that was grown was cotton and that included here and this is part of the Black Belt Prairie of eastern Mississippi and a lot of cotton was grown here continuously year after year after year for decades. And you can imagine how that seriously depleted the soil. So that's basically what we were dealing with. And so here's the starting point. We actually viewed this, we had, we've been working with adaptive grazing and regenerative ag for a long time. And with this farm, we decided from the very beginning we would use it as a case study very purposefully and we would measure a whole host of parameters as we went along. So here are some of the starting measurements that we were dealing with. Soil organic matters range from 1.3 to 1.6 percent and this 
particular farm is about a thousand acres. So it gives you an idea of the size. Uh, so across that thousand acres, uh, again, the soil organic matters ranged below 2% from the low ones to the mid ones. Water infiltration rates were pretty poor. They were less than a half inch an hour. So in practical terms, what that meant <clears throat> was that for every one inch of rain that fell, this farm was only infiltrating about two tenths of an inch. So eight tenths of an inch or 80% of every rainfall that occurred here was essentially ponding and pooling and running off. Plant bricks, in last Tuesday's webinar, we, we covered some data and details about bricks. And so y'all, if you were on that webinar, you're familiar with what we talked about and, and what bricks means. Plant bricks was very low. So the predominant forage species the plant bricks averaged only about 2%. And we had forage agronomists from Mississippi State University and NRCS personnel come out and do a what they consider to be a forage inventory. And as most of you can imagine, that would have been predominantly what we would term today as improved forage varieties. They only found about three to four of those present across this acre at that point in time that were actively growing. And it took a little better than six acres to support a cow-calf unit during the active growing season, which is not very good for this part of the country. So that very first winter, there wasn't a lot there to graze on a lot of this. So we implemented some bale grazing and towards the end of the webinar this evening, we'll be talking more about bale grazing, what it means, how to properly do it and some of the benefits that we can derive from it. And then once we got into that next spring, the spring of 2010, we implemented high stock density, short duration grazing with long rest periods. Now it is very important to note that fertilizer, seeding, mowing, and herbicides were not used during the time period here. So cattle were the primary tool used to be able to regenerate this particular farm. This picture indicates what it looked like in the year one grazing season. So the spring and summer of 2010, this is what it looked like. Now the set of cows that was dropped in here, they had never had to graze pastures full of what you see here. And it, as you can clearly look at the slide and see that it is predominantly what we would term weeds or forbs. And that was everything from uh, common ragweed to giant ragweed to sumac to blackberry, uh, ash. There was a lot of ironweed, pigweed, so on and so forth, mare's tail, you name it. Practically everything that you, if you wanted to have a weed class, this would have been a good area to have a weed class. And this is what the cattle had to eat. And these were gestating, lactating, spring calving cows expected to breed back that summer that were dropped in here. So what we did was we went in and we started utilizing stock densities that ranged anywhere from a low of about 40,000 pounds per acre to at times we got up close to a million pounds per acre on certain sections of, of the farm. The bottom left picture, uh, those are my grandkids. And uh, of course they were a lot younger at that point in time in 2010, uh, but they, they helped me out quite a bit during those years in, in helping us to move cattle, build polywire fence and so forth. This is what the paddocks would look like when the cattle would come out. They learned very quickly within a matter of days actually to eat practically all of these forbs or weeds that were growing in there. And this is what it would look like. So, you know, down in Mississippi, the giant ragweed and, and the ironweed, those types of forbs can grow very tall, six to eight feet tall. And the cattle would go in and strip, as you can see from these pictures, they would strip the leaves of these weeds off of the stalks. And then we would have trample and, in that type of thing. And what we found 
was that the cattle were actually gaining body condition and not losing body condition in spite of the fact that this is what they had to eat. And so we did both a lot of bricks measurement and actual plant tissue analysis. And we found that these weeds, these forbs, and if you remember last time, we talked about secondary and tertiary metabolites and the benefits of those that are produced by a lot of forbs. Well, we had a lot of that going for us because we had a lot of forbs. And what we found was that these forbs were very richly mineralized, number one. They were high in protein and also high in TDN and net energies. So the cattle actually performed once they learned to eat these and they absolutely had to be trained to eat those. And we did those through higher stock. We did the training through higher stock density. Once they learned to eat these, then they, they gained quite well and performed quite well on this type of diet mixed with the grasses and legumes that were in here also. This is year two. So you can already see a definitive difference in the array of plant species that are out here. And again, remember, no fertilizer, no mowing, no herbicide, no seeding. So everything that happened here happened due to the impact of the cattle and using the cattle as our land regenerate, regenerative tool. We certainly saw a number of different species coming up from the latent seed bank and responding in year two. Year three, you can once again see a very dramatic difference in what was happening here. And on the right hand side, those two pictures, top and bottom, show previously grazed paddocks and the paddock that we had just moved them into. So you can see the difference between the post gray, the pre grays and the post grays. And then year four. So by year four, we had a very dramatic difference in the amount of forage biomass that was being produced annually. And on top of that, we had a significant increase in the number of forage species that were present. This included the principle of diversity and the rule of three that we talked about last time. So we had quite a few grasses, legumes, and forbs coming up. And out of those, that included a mix of both warm and cool season. So both C4s and C3s, as well as a number of biennials. So we were very pleased with what we saw. In addition, we had a number of native tall grass species and native prairie species showing up. And down here in the Black Belt Prairie, it was a southern vestige of the North American native tall grass prairie. So we saw blue stem, Indian grass, gamma grass, and so forth, uh, bundle flower, all of those types of things appearing. So at the end of year four, here's what we measured. Soil organic matters after just four years increased from that mid ones, the one three to one six that I showed earlier, to five two to five six, so the mid fives. Forage species increased to more than 43, including native plant species. Plant bricks went from an average of 2% to between 15 and 22%. So, and as you remember from the charts and graphs, the data that we presented last Tuesday on bricks, that's a very, very dramatic difference to go from a bricks of 2% to up to 22%. And obviously that meant a significant difference in the performance of the cattle. Water infiltration rates increased from less than a half inch to more than 10 inches an hour stocking rate decreased from requiring more than six acres per animal unit to 1.5 acres per animal unit, which essentially means that over that four year period, because of the increased carrying capacity, we gained free acres. Those were acres that were right under our feet all the time, that all we had to do was just manage them differently 
to be able to add significant numbers of animal units. We also saw quite an increase in earthworms, soil level insects, pollinators, and wildlife. This slide shows an example of how we moved the cattle. They are very easily trained. For those of you on the webinar tonight that have been doing this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Once you, and it doesn't take long to train these cattle to move from paddock to paddock to paddock or even across your farm. So this, this slide depicts moving the cattle across the farm and what we were doing, the cattle had been over on the east end of the farm, and the farm from east to west was about two miles long. So they'd been all the way over on the east end, and we wanted to move them back over to the west end to start a new rotation. So they had to cross two miles of a lot of grass that had recovered from previous grazing. All it took was one person on the on the utv here and the cattle follow that utv wherever you want them to go so as you can see they lined up and spread out and followed us across that two mile area of pasture they never stopped to graze this fresh forage as long as we kept moving so as long as we keep moving, the cattle will keep following us until we stop. And then when we stop, they stop. So they, they get to trust you and figure out that, well, if he doesn't want us to stop here, there must be something even better further along. And so the bottom left picture is when we stopped at our gap gate where we wanted to turn them into a new paddock. And you can see the cattle starting to congregate here. So we waited on the stragglers to catch up coming across the two miles, and then the bottom right, turning them into the new paddock. This is the impact that we want on a lot of our paddocks to build new soil organic matter, new carbon, stimulate microbial activity, and increase biomass production and water infiltration. So as you can see, the cattle have been in this paddock under a higher density, in this particular slide, the stock densities were about 300,000 pounds per acre, and you can see the trample impact as a result of that. In the right half, the picture there is obviously a manure pat. We pay very close attention each and every day to the manure pats of our cattle in these paddocks. The manure pat that you see on the right is what we want these manure patties to look like. We want them to be fairly round in shape, piled up in a consistency like a thick pancake batter with a dimple somewhere on top. This indicates that the cattle are getting a good mix of both protein and energy or carbohydrates in the forages that they're grazing in that paddock. Now we'll take a look at differences in manure patties. So the two on the top pictures, the top left and the top right, again, you see fairly round in shape, stacked up in, the, in a pancake batter consistency with a dimple somewhere on top, close to the middle. The two pictures, bottom left, in, they're runny, loose. Those indicate cattle that are getting too much protein in their diet that day. And so their manure pats are loose and runny. And then the one on the bottom right indicates cattle that are consuming too much fiber, too much lignin. And therefore you see a distinct layering in the stacking of this manure paddy. So this is a, an example of what we need to be looking for each and every day to make sure our cattle are getting the right composition of protein to energy in their diet. So again, the desired composition results in the manure patties that look similar to what you see in the top pictures and undesirable would be what you see in the bottom three pictures. Now we also implemented a lot of bale grazing, as I mentioned earlier in the winter time, and down here obviously we don't have the snow, but we have lots and lots and lots of rain and cold rains. And 
that can very quickly make for muddy conditions. So we have to be very careful in how we bale graze down here through the winter because our ground's obviously not frozen and it can be very saturated with rain. But basically what we're doing here is we're spacing our bales out about every 25 to 30 foot apart and then using poly wire to control the cattle access. Now there's two optimum times of the year to implement what I term ultra high stop density grazing, which would mean over 250,000 pounds up to a million pounds or more. And the two times of the year that we can do this most effectively are with winter bale grazing, because we can obviously con concentrate cattle in very high numbers with a very high stock density per acre. And you can see that illustrated in these pictures here. These are stock densities approaching a million pounds per acre around these bales. We also do it in the active growing season. And the best time to implement ultra high stock density during the active growing season is when we have ground, our soil is dry enough to hold the cattle up well, and we have a lot of forage biomass accumulated. So we don't want to do this in the early and mid spring when we have lower growing, very highly vegetative forage. That's when we want to go lower stock densities because we can't get the degree of trample that we're after to build new soil carbon and new organic matter. We just simply don't have enough forage at that point in time, and it's wet and washy forage. So I want a lot of dry matter. So the strategy is don't try to use ultra high stock density on every acre of your farm or ranch every year. Designate certain areas each year for the ultra high stock density impact, and then let those acres build and accumulate forage biomass. I want it as thick and dense and as tall as I can possibly get it. My goal during that particular point in time is not necessarily cattle nutrition, it is building, using my cattle as a tool to build new organic matter and lay down a lot of carbon and really stimulate that microbial population underneath the soil. And I only do it, again, during those time periods in the summer when I can accumulate enough biomass for most of us that's gonna be a June or July time period that it is most effective and you have a lot of biomass that you can lay down. Now, this is another thing that we do. We stockpile a lot of our summer forages for winter grazing so that we can significantly reduce and even eliminate the need to feed hay during the winter. And by the way, we not only do this down south here where I live, but we've done it in North Dakota and Minnesota and Wisconsin and Saskatchewan and Manitoba and Alberta and Ontario and so forth. So we've done it points north and points south and everywhere in between. And what we have found is that a lot of C4s, particularly if you have a lot of diversity in the mix, and diversity is really key to being able to effectively have some really high quality stockpiled summer perennials for winter grazing. So this is stockpile prairie down in Mississippi and, and we use it for the winter grazing. This is January, turning the cattle on to this fresh stockpile. Now, one thing to note about stockpile grazing is that you still want to treat it similar to you treat your active growing season grazing. Remember when we said you want to take half and leave half approximately? Well, you want to leave residue on the ground in the winter as well. You do not want to allow your cattle to take that stockpile all the way down to the soil. 
Again, that'll set your microbes back. It takes the ins winter insulation off of the soil and it'll set back gro new growth coming in the next spring. So leave residue, leave armor on the soil, even when you're grazing stockpile in the winter time. Now, as Pete mentioned, I'm also heavily involved with Team Soil Carbon and we're doing a lot of uh, paired comparison studies across North America comparing adaptive grazing farms and ranches to those that are conventional grazing. And we're collecting an awful lot of data. What you see here is a flux tower. And these towers are placed on cooperating farms and ranches, and they measure greenhouse gas emissions, rainfall, weather, and so forth all at once. So it's a very, very sophisticated piece of equipment and allows us to be able to capture some very unique data on these operations. This is another example of a flux tower, just a slightly different model that we're using as well. Now, here's an example of a farm grazing design layout. Now, please, the one thing I want to caution you here, don't take this example and put it into stone okay there's many many different ways to do a grazing design layout for a farm or ranch and it all depends on a whole host of factors your topography where you have water located or where you plan to have water uh, the other types of enterprises that you have going on all types of things impact how you lay out a grazing design but what you see here is you see the fencing layout over the portion of the farm that is predominantly used for year round grazing. And the blue dotted lines are water lines that were put in. And the little blue figures are the water troughs, the watering spots for each of these areas. So you can see very clearly how this was laid out. And you can see the design of the paddocks and how those paddocks are designed and fit around each of these watering points. Now, again, as I said last time and the time before, adaptive grazing is not a formula. It's not a recipe. It's not a set system. You have to be able to adapt. And so you will not have the same size paddocks, the same diameter paddocks or even the same configuration to your paddocks year in and year out based on improving and increased performance. So this design that you see here, all of this internal fencing is temporary, single strand polywire with tread in post. And we will change that every year based on the response and our desired goals and objectives and stock densities year in and year out. Now you can see that there's cropland attached to this farm as well. And what we wanna do is we wanna be able to utilize grazing of our livestock in the cropland as well. And this is all species of livestock. We can effectively use them in multi-species cover crops planted in between our cash crops. So we certainly wanna be able to take advantage of that. And the other thing that we want to do is to be able to add multiple other enterprises. You see up here, I have things, not only the multi-species cover crops and livestock, and we can have multiple species of livestock, but we can also have mixed fruit and nut orchards interspersed around the farm. We can add beehives to produce honey as an additional revenue stream. And we can add specialty grains and even organic crops and specialty crops to enhance revenue. Now I'm gonna show you a few pictures here real quickly just to give you some ideas of tools and resources that'll help you to be able to effectively do your grazing on a daily basis. So these are time release latches. If you wanna do multiple moves a day, but you have another job or you wanna be, you wanna be off doing something else, then you can use these time release latches and your livestock will move themselves from paddock to paddock throughout the day. So what you see here is called a bat 
latch. This is an official bat latch, and they are simply a programmable timer. They now have them with a little solar panel on top that keeps a battery charged, and you can program in when you want them to release either a spring gate or a bungee gate. And the cattle will move themselves once that, once that spring gate or bungee gate is released. Now, these are very effective tools, and we have a number of these that we use on a day-in, day-out basis. But they're pricey. They, they'll cost you around $350 to $400 per bat latch. However, it's like my temporary fencing in my water. It's an investment, not a cost. If I use these, I'm able to effectively increase stock densities and do a far better job of achieving the things that I want to achieve. This picture shows a series of six bat latches set up going up the hill here, up slope. And the cattle, again, just simply move themselves. So they have a series of seven paddocks set up for the day with six gates here entering into each of the seven paddocks and they can easily move themselves from paddock to paddock to paddock throughout the day without anybody being there. We start the first paddock at your water source and then they move across each paddock through the day and come back across previously grazed paddocks for water. Do not electrify the bungee gates or the spring gates. There's no need to do that. Your cattle are already trained to the poly wire, so they're not gonna test them. And if they're not electrified, then when they are released by the bat latch, you don't have shorten out occurring when they hit the ground. There's, I have a number of clients that are very enterprising that have developed their own homemade bat latches. And if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me describe this particular model made out of PVC pipe and a greenhouse timer as the Home Depot bat latch. And we call it that because you can buy every bit of these materials at a local hardware store. So very simple. Up above the, um, the, the greenhouse timer there, you see a little air valve. So we can just take a hand pump and fill this cylinder there with air. There's a little push rod going down. We have a U-bolt at the bottom. And when the timer goes off, it releases the air pressure, it pushes down the push rod, which pushes down the U-bolt and releases the gap gate. This is another more streamlined version of that Home Depot bat latch. Again, you can buy all of these materials at a local hardware store to make essentially the same type of, of, of latch. This is uh, from a dairy farm up in Illinois that we're working with. Uh, so a dairy grazer, and he came up with this particular version of a home bat latch. So he's got a solar panel up top, charging a panel in the white post beneath. And he's got a little geared timer in here. And this little apparatus that is holding the bungee gate turns as the gears turn on the timer until it eventually releases the bungee gate. Or you can make your multiple daily moves as simple as this, just with multiple reels of poly wire. And again, you can see that, you know, the reels are here, the moves are relatively short, and it takes literally one to two minutes, that's it, to reel this up and to let the cattle move from one paddock to the next, to the next. So here's some ideas on UTV and ATV rigging. This is my rig. This is uh, how we rig most of our UTVs. And we like to double deck them. The bottom deck we fill, we subdivide and, and so that we can keep our different types of posts that we're using clearly organized. And up top, we store our reels, gate handles, uh, alligator clips, all of the other items that we need to make things very handy. This is a rig from one of my clients down in South Texas. This is a Kawasaki mule, and they were very innovative in, in what they did here. You can see that they have, on the back headache rack, they have plenty of room 
to, to store multiple reels, geared reels and so forth. They devise the apparatus that you see in the middle picture to hold a reel so that you can hook the reel in the slots here on the square tubing. You can see that they have a clamp with wing nuts that they screw down the clamp on top of the geared reel to hold it in place, hook it in, and then just drive down the line where you're going to put in your new line. The top left picture is a very simple rigging to be able to not have to get out and lower poly wire to drive from one paddock to the next. So if you have multiple paddocks constructed at the same time, this just simply picks the poly wire up, takes it up over top of the UTV and drops it down the back side. And this is very, very cheap to do. You can see that they, they jury rigged it. You know, they took uh, twine and tied it up front. And this is just PVC poly pipe. That's all it is. So very, very cheap to do this. And it works very, very effectively. The bottom right picture, they do a lot of very long runs with their poly wire and so that they can drive a straight line and know the point that they're going to as they're reeling out their wire they designed this basically orange reflectance plate on top of pvc pipe so that they can put it out and very easily see where they're driving to as a reference point this is a, a ATV rig at Greg Judy's farm in Missouri, and these are his interns using this rig. Again, you can see that they have a basket up front for storing their poly wire. All of their different types of posts are on back, and the bar coming out at a 45 degree angle on front, many of you have seen these and may even have them. It just simply takes the wire, either poly wire or a single strand of hard wire, and routes it up underneath the UTV and over top. So again, you can just drive right over the top of it without having to get out. This is another one of my clients uh, down in Texas, and this is their rig. Again, you can see some rather unique ideas that they've implemented in what they're doing. And once again, they have a, a 45 degree angle bar on front to be able to route wire up underneath as they drive across it. This is a rig from one of our clients up in Manitoba, uh, Canada, and you can see a very well rigged out ATV. So up front, they have plenty of space to store their reels. They have uh, excellent apparatus to store their pigtail posts so that they don't get tangled. And then a, a uh, kit in the back that stores all of their other fencing tools that they need throughout the day. Some ideas on water. One of the things that we do is we allow our cattle to be able to water directly out of the ponds, but yet only at designated watering ramps. So we ring our ponds with poly wire and keep them out of it but we build these 12 foot wide and you don't want them any wider than 12 foot. There's a reason for that because you want, you want cattle to learn to take turns going down and watering. We build them, take an excavator or track hoe, trench out 12 foot wide. We lay down geotextile fabric and rock over top of that. And the rock extends all the way out to see where the post, it, you see the post and the wire in the water. So the cattle can walk out into the pond on this hard surface and drink and then walk back out. And because it's narrow and cattle wanting to water, they don't congregate in here. Uh, it keeps the water clean and it keeps them from lounging in the pond and mucking it up and depositing manure and urine and all of that into your ponds. The other thing that we've done is we push polypipe through or not poly pipe, but piping through our levees, and we gravity flow from many of our ponds out to remote watering troughs. This is another thing that we and our clients do quite a bit. Uh, we run water lines with risers. Uh, the risers are situated typically every 300 to 800 feet, depending on the specific situation. And we put quick couplers on these risers so that we can have many alternatives 
on how to use those risers. I don't like to put permanent watering troughs at my risers. I like to have options and to be able to move my troughs around these risers, even as many as 200 feet off of a particular riser with hose. This is a 100 gallon water made rub, uh, or rubber made, excuse me, water trough. And this is John Lot down near Horton, Texas. And it gets really hot and humid down there in the summertime. He waters a cow herd of 250 head all summer long off of this 100 gallon rubber made water trough with an eight gallon per minute fill rate. Now, how does he do that? It's because the cattle have been trained to come to water two to four head at a time. And you can see the cattle doing this. They will stage themselves in groups and you'll have little small groups coming up and leaving the watering spot all day long. This is Gabe and Paul Brown laying water line at their ranch in Bismarck. And again, you can see what the risers and the quick couplers look like. We use a lot of tire tanks wherever we put in a permanent watering spot. I like these because they're tough, they're durable, and they're, they're just pretty much impossible to tear up. There's all different ideas that you can have with tire tanks. Uh, this is also in South, this is in North Dakota. Uh, at the Dickinson Research Station, and you can see what they've done to be able to utilize their tire tanks. We also use a lot of portable water. So this is an idea of how to rig up portable water. We have the trawls permanently affixed to the trailer with a reel with our water line on that reel. You can see another shot of it here, and we use a lot of different variations of this to be able to extend our water and to be able to better graze in many different areas. Another idea is you can have your water troughs on a sled and just simply have a chain or cable attached, hook it over the, the hitch on an ATV or UTV and pull them from spot to spot to spot. This is another portable waterer. Uh, this particular water that you see pictured here, this will also water 200 plus head of cattle even down south in, in our heat and humidity during the summertime. Again, with cattle trained to come to water just a few head at a time. You can also make permanent watering blocks. And this is an example of what a permanent watering block would look like. You would build your pad, lay down geotextile fabric, put aggregate rock over top of that. And then you can make your, uh, your, your, paddock around the watering block that allows access to paddocks splintering off of that. All right, so let's dive into just a handful of additional case studies here. This is Grant and Dawn and Carly Bright Crutes up in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. And this is a picture that Grant took, and he's taken quite a few of these. He said he's seeing more and more dust blowing around their area and this just simply shouldn't be happening we talked about that in the very first webinar uh, but this was his direct statement he said sadly this has become more common during the spring in our area now when they first started into cover cropping and adaptive grazing and all of that they were trying to plant single species cover crops and what Grant told me was that two out of every three years were a big failure, and he emphasized the word big, were a big failure for multiple reasons. He said they had a lack of moisture in the ground, uh, they had incorrect, they, they were doing monocultures instead of polyculture cover crops, they had issues with herbicide residual and so forth, and they were also, they didn't understand at that time how to how to set their drills to plant different cover crops and so forth. So there were a lot of different issues that they were facing. And it wasn't until they started moving towards more complex cover crop mixes like the one that you see here, that they started experiencing a much higher level of success. This is a cover crop in September that was planted after their wheat harvest that summer. 
And then you can see what that same cover crop looked at the very end of October. So you can see that they have a lot of biomass ready for feeding their cattle that winter. Now, one of the things that Grant has done is he has adapted a no-till drill to be able to intercede his cover crops into standing corn in the V4 to V5 stage, as you see pictured here. And we're doing that in many different areas across North America now highly effectively. We're also aerially seeding a lot of these cover crops into standing cash crops, as well as using high boys with drop down tunnels and high speed wind velocity to be able to blow the cover crop seed on using the high boys. This is what the cover crop looks like when it was seeded in that V4 stage corn. And this is what it looked like at corn harvest, chopping corn silage that fall. So what happens is the cover crop just sort of, it germinates and comes up, but during the canopy, it just sort of stagnates and sits there waiting on sunlight. And when you either harvest corn for silage or it dries down harvesting for grain, then, and the sunlight can now hit this cover crop very well, it takes off and explodes. As you see here, this is corn that has not yet been harvested for grain, but as it dried down and the sunlight started hitting the soil underneath it again, you can see the cover crop exploded. And we can very quickly get on that and graze it right after harvest of the corn. These two pictures, the top left is a picture of soil from Grant's field, and you can see it's developed quite a bit of aggregation. And then, and he's been using no-till now for the last 10 years. And then this is soil from his neighbor's field right across the road. And you can see that it's dry, dusty, very low levels of aggregation. When rain hits it, it's gonna collapse upon itself and crust over top, and the water's gonna pond and pool and run off, carrying with it sediment, nitrates, phosphates, and so forth. Now we did a field day there last November in connection with the pasture project. And we dug a soil pit using a backhoe. Now this was very interesting. What you see here on the left-hand side, you see the yellowish looking soil, the lighter colored soil. That's what they were farming 10 and 12 years ago. Look at the degree of new soil that they built using diverse cover crops and adaptive grazing impact on top of what they used to farm. So they built soil up. And we're seeing this all across North America now. There's a lot of data from Australia and other countries as well showing this exact same thing. The picture on the right-hand side is pretty interesting. Where you see the trowel, this picture was taken and a portion of their field that was close to a county road. 10 years ago, they resurfaced that county road. And in the process of doing so, the county dug up the old roadbed, the sand and gravel and all of that, and dumped portions of it over into Grant's field. And we found that gravel and sand layer. That's where you see the trowel. And in 10 years, the intervening 10 years, they had built almost 10 inches of new soil on top of that roadbed layer where they dumped the sand and the gravel from the old road. Now this was in November, uh, it was 11 degrees the night before and it was well below freezing for several nights ahead of that. And you can see we have living roots at various depths in the ground and you can of course see still a lot of green in these cover crops. So we had living roots anywhere from 10 inches to 17 inches all the way to 30 inches and below. Now, one of the things that we also noted, we saw living active earthworms just a couple of inches below the soil surface here at 11 degrees ambient temperature. Across the road in his neighbor's field, that soil was frozen all the way to the top layer of soil. You couldn't even hardly stick a shovel in it. It was frozen solid. And this soil was soft and pliable at, with active earthworms even into November.
this is what the cover crop looked like up top. So they had plenty of high quality standing cover crop to graze for that winter. Now these are some of their three year cover crop trial results. They've participated in a grazing cover crops trial with the pasture project. And we have both a control plot that where no cover crops and no livestock impact were employed between the cash crops and then the treatment plot where we planted complex covers and incorporated livestock under adaptive grazing on those complex covers. So if we look at the total living microbial biomass in that first column, you can see that we had significantly higher microbial biomass in the treatment versus the control. Our total bacteria and total fungi were both higher as well. Our pH was a full point higher. The organic matter was more than a full point higher, full percent higher. Total carbon was greater and the cation exchange capacity was twice what it was in the control plot. After just the, this is just after three years in this trial. And here are some of his economic data. So you can see that with grazing the cover crops, he produced that winter $153 per acre net gain off the cattle on top of what he made with the prior year's wheat crop. And for the next year's crop, he had a total net gain per acre of $190 over prior net gains. And this included the reduced fertilizer and herbicide cost, as well as the grazing of the cattle. Okay, another example here, and this is just very recent. We just got this data in from a client in Kenansville, North Carolina. And Adam shared this with us this week. But Adam just started two years ago. He was a very conventional farmer, both cattle, pigs, and row crops. And so just two years ago, we got him started with adaptive management, regenerative management, planting complex cover crops, grazing those, rolling those crops down to plant his cash crops into them, and doing adaptive grazing with both his cattle and the pigs. So he in incorporated no-till. He planted non-GMO seed instead of GMO seed. He hasn't used any glyphosate now in more than 12 months. He planted the corn crop you're getting ready to see in the upcoming picture into a standing cover crop. And he now has significantly improved water infiltration and resiliency in his crop. His next door neighbor, and I mean immediately next door, the field right adjacent to the field that I'm getting ready to show you the pictures of, he's a, a very conventional farmer. He is just now moving into no-till. They both planted their corn the very first week of April. So they were basically planting at the same time. He's still heavily dependent on synthetic inputs, no cover crop, no livestock integration here. He's got very poor water infiltration and poor crop vitality. And as a matter of fact, his first seeding failed and he had to reseed again, whereas Adam did not have to. This is the difference. This photo was taken two days ago, just two days ago on the 29th. And you see a very stark contrast here between the two crops. Also note that on the neighbor's farm, you see a lot of standing pooling water in his cornfield. And there's none of that, uh, again, immediately next door in Adam's field. Now, another couple of comparisons. This is um, an organic farm comparison up in Minnesota. And we were taking a look at the number of microbial phyla and active species. And you can see that on the organic farm that utilized covers, livestock, and minimum till, we had 17 identified microbial phyla and over 45,000 active species. On the neighboring organic farm where no covers or livestock were used and they were using high degrees of tillage to control weeds, only four microbial phyla were present 
and only 1,200 microbial active microbial species. This is showing the same two farms in a pie diagram, and you can see the, the dramatic difference between farm one that incorporated cover crops and livestock versus farm two that did not. And again, represented here by the bar graphs. The bar graph on the left-hand side shows the total number of active microbial species by type, color-coded, versus farm two and their total number of microbial active microbial species. This is a pecan orchard. This is compared to an adjacent adaptively grazed pasture. And it's a rather stark contrast. You can see the pecan orchard is basically microbially a desert, whereas the adaptively grazed pasture right next door has far higher microbial activity. Okay, Ohio, this was done by Green Acres Research Farm. Here, what they did was they planted a warm season cover crop in between some cash crops. This is 55 days after planting. They had 8,500 pounds per acre of dry matter. No fertilizer was applied, even a, not even a starter. Over a 120 day grazing period, the steers gained approximately three pounds per day. And at the second grazing, it had recovered enough so that they had 4,500 pounds per acre of dry matter to graze. This is what happened over the course of that 120 day grazing season. So they planted an 18 species warm season cocktail mix and their soil organic matter increased from 3.6% to 4% a gain of 0.4%. They increased water holding capacity per acre by 20,000 gallons. Soil nitrogen increased by 58 pounds per acre. Mineral value by $105. And the soil microbial activity, 44%. And earthworms increased to more than 130,000 counted earthworms per acre. So there's many more examples. They will be in the slide set that is attached to this webinar. So you will have access to that. But I have a number of other case studies that show examples even in more arid and semi-arid environments. So, and there's also additional examples of bale grazing. So I wanna move now to the Q&A session. And there are a couple of questions from last time that we didn't have time to address. And I wanna quickly address and then we'll move to your other questions. Uh, so we talked earlier about the times of year that it's best to either increase or decrease stock densities, especially when you want to do ultra high. I have another question that asks, do you need to measure each type of plant in the pasture for bricks content and average the percent? And the answer is yes. You do want to measure the different types of plant species individually to see what they're doing because there can be differences between the different plant species in their bricks. Another question is how do you manage the stage of grazing because we've emphasized grazing as much as we can at mid-maturity. How do we manage to do that if all your paddocks are at about the same stage at the same time, particularly in the spring? Well, one of the ways to do that in early spring is to flash start off your grazing flashing them through really quickly so only allow them to take about 20 percent and move them forward much more rapidly and even incorporate some dry hay in there to help slow down the passage of that highly vegetative early spring growth and then what you'll find is typically after that first round of very rapid grazing then you can pretty much control what's going on in terms of stage maturity as you continue around on that second and third rotation. So it becomes far easier to manage stage of maturity of your forages as you move into the second and third rotations. Another question, what does a mid-maturity grass look like? Well, basically mid-maturity is when those grasses are at about the boot stage, closing in, and right at and just beyond the boot stage. 
is typically going to define a mid-maturity grass. And you always achieve better results at grazing paddocks at mid-stage maturity when you don't have near monocultures. Near monocultures are always much harder to manage in this regard. But when you're able to develop a much higher level of plant species diversity, then this becomes far easier to be able to graze your paddocks at or around this mid-stage of maturity for the majority of the plant species. So Pete, I'll entertain other questions at this time as well. Great, thanks Alan. And just shift back to the presentation here to wrap this up. Um, thanks for the presentation, Alan. We do have quite a few questions that have come through. So we'll do our best to uh, combine questions as much as possible. Uh, and we'll also uh, encourage you to submit any additional questions. We'll just keep going right up to the end of the uh, allotted time and we'll get through as many as we can. And again, uh, we'll make sure that we send any questions that don't get answered to Alan so that he can cover them via email. So Alan, we'll start with a quick question. Um, there was one, just a quick clarifying question about the, the microbial, the metagenomic uh, graphs that you showed. And someone was interested in um, how you uh, gather the data for that kind of test and how you can have that kind of information on your own farm. Okay, so it's just as simple as taking a, a soil, collecting a soil sample just like you would for a standard soil test. No difference. You just take either a shovel or a core sampler uh, like you would use in, in a typical soil sampling situation, gather your cores, mix them all together, and then send them off to the lab for this analysis. And I'll talk about which lab or labs can do this here in just a second. But you do not need to do gridded or zoned sampling for this like you're encouraged to do for a standard soil test because biology doesn't change like that. If your fields are fairly homogeneous in terms of how they produce, if you don't have very distinct differences in performance of your fields, then you can take multiple cores at random locations around and combine them all into a single sample. So biology doesn't change. Active biology doesn't change according to soil type. You know, we can have the exact same active biology in all different soil types. And we've demonstrated that by the analysis that we've done. And biology doesn't know that you separated field A from field B by a ditch or a fence line or even a tree line. If, they, if they're performing similarly, field A and field B, the core samples can be combined. So you can have far fewer samples to analyze. And obviously a metagenomic analysis is a much more expensive analysis. It's about a $250 analysis, in, depending on the lab, anywhere from about $180 to $250 per sample. So you do not want to do zoned or gridded sampling here, and it's wholly unnecessary. So what are the labs? So you collect the, collect the cores. You want to protect them from the sunlight and protect them from drying out. So I carry a cooler with me and a Ziploc baggie, just a quart size Ziploc baggie. Put your, court, your mixed up samples into the Ziploc baggies. Take a, a, a permanent Sharpie and write on there all of your information, the date collected, your farm name, the field number, all of those, anything else you want the lab to know, and put them into the cooler and keep them protected and then ship them overnight to the lab. So what we do is uh, we put them in the refrigerator overnight uh, and then the next day put them in a cardboard box, crumple up newspaper to help insulate and then just ship them overnight to the lab. So the labs that'll do this currently, there's not a lot of labs that'll do this type of analysis, but the labs that'll do uh, at least some type of more detailed biological ana analysis are Ward Lab, W-A-R-D, in Kearney, Nebraska, and that's wardlab.com, uh, and Ward Lab will do what we call a PLFA biological analysis. That's the test you want from them. 
Quorum Labs, Q-U-O-R-U-M in Southern Illinois, and their website is quoruml.com. And they do what they call a bioprofile or a complete DNA metagenomic analysis. And then the third lab in, is Earthfort Labs, and that's earthfort.com. And what they do is a, they do an actual microscopic bi, microbiological count. And so they'll give you your fun, your counts on your fungi, identifiable bacteria, and so forth. So those are your three options for a more detailed analysis. The analysis that I was presenting was data from the metagenomic or the DNA analysis performed by Quorum Lab. Great, thank you, Alan. Uh, two questions that I'm going to combine here are uh, around some of thinking about some of the, speci the specifics for paddock layout. One question came uh, from someone who's joining us from Florida, from North Florida, uh, and was asking about um, how important it is to plan paddocks around access to shade. And then there was another uh, person who asked about any recommendations for paddock layout uh, if they are uh, operating a grazing dairy. Okay, so definitely, you know, you it, particularly if you're in in the south and the deep south, you want to plant paddocks around shade, or you want to have portable shade structures. So th that's that's important, you know, and that's definitely a consideration. Now, remember last time. In Tuesday's webinar, we showed data that talked about the temperature of the soil and protecting soil temperature and soil moisture. And we said when you do that, your cattle actually perform better even when the ambient temperature is hotter and they don't need to seek shade and water as much, but they still need shade and water. So as you design paddocks, orient them so that you can incorporate shade and water. Now, natural shade is always best. You know, it's gonna be cooler in natural shade than it will be under artificial shade with, with uh, shade cloth shelters. So you access it. The beautiful thing about polywire is I can build lanes. I can dip in to sections of my woods with the polywire and incorporate sections of shade because polywire will bend to my will. So I can make any kind of configuration I need to, to allow those cattle to access shade. So in paddocks that touch woods, then I'll just use polywire to dip into the woods to access that shade. In paddocks that may not touch the woods, then I will build lanes that will allow the cattle to move into shade and then back out into the paddocks to graze. So definitely take that into consideration and understand that you there's a whole host of configurations, whether you're laning or dipping in or whatever. We've we've also taken woods that may be a little thicker and and we've taken dozers and just cut fence lanes through the woods at varying intervals so that we can access different sections of woods to allow shade for our cattle. So again, shade is like water and fencing. It's an investment, not a cost, because it helps your cattle to perform better. And Alan, do you have any recommendations uh, or is there anything specific about dairies uh, that uh, someone would need to take into consideration ah, uh, when laying out okay. there? Yep, for dairies, obviously you got to, you got to, you're milking them twice a day, morning and evening. So you've got to configure the layout of your grazing paddocks, particularly with the, with the actively lactating cows that you're milking every day so that the cattle can easily get back up to the milking parlor and back out to the grazing paddocks. So again, this can be sort of a wagon wheel type design going around your milking parlor. If you have pastures laid or, around the milking parlor and the milking parlor is located more towards the center of your farm. If not, 
and it's more towards one side, then you use a series of lanes to be able to move your cattle into paddock, in and out of paddocks. You time your rotations based on the milkings. Uh, many of the grazing areas that we're working with currently actually move their cattle two to four times a day in between milkings to fresh paddocks. Uh, with some of the dairies that we're working with in the deep south, they've installed center pivots and we actually use the pivots, the cattle follow the pivot and the pivots missed the cattle in the paddocks that they're grazing and move with the cattle to keep them misted as they're grazing when it gets really hot and humid. And obviously you don't want to do that all the time. You want to use that misting only when it gets hot and humid enough that that will be required for the cattle. Uh, but that's another very effective way that we've used with, with some of our grazing dairies that we're working with to be able to allow them to, and with that, they don't even have to have shade because they're misted during the day and they just stay out in the sunlight all day long, moving with the pivot, grazing those paddocks until they're brought back in for milking that evening. Great, thanks, Alan. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in. We got about five minutes left. So again, if we don't get to your question, uh, we will uh, try to make sure we follow up via email. Uh, one of the questions uh, that's coming from quite a few folks uh, that all seem to be similar um, is around um, determining the number of days per move um, and how to balance uh, a, a grazing operation when you have a full-time job that might take you off farm. Okay, if you have a full-time, it takes you off farm and any do, then you know you can you can still move your cattle at least once a day without any problem. You know, th this takes, if you have an all farm job, then typically, you know, you have a smaller herd. So your paddocks are significantly smaller. Your stretches of poly wire are significantly shorter. And so, you know, it takes you 30 minutes or less to build a paddock. Uh, so you can either build a paddock before you go to work in the morning, build it after you get home in the evening. Now, we said last time, you know, ideally you want to move your cattle in the afternoon to take advantage of higher bricks. If you have a difficult time getting that done, then I understand that. Yeah, and you move them when you can. We, we all understand, you know, just having to facilitate doing what we have to do. But everybody can, can take 30 minutes or less to build a paddock and move cattle at least once a day. If you utilize bat latches, then it makes it even easier. You can actually move them multiple times a day while you're at work and, and you're in town job and they're moving themselves utilizing the bat latches or some version thereof of a time release latch. And you can set the time to where the majority of those multiple moves during the day are in the afternoon so that you can take advantage of the higher bricks. Uh, so again, this doesn't take a lot of time once you get used to it. And you can very easily and effectively do this even if you have an in-town job or an off-farm job. The other things that you can consider, you know, my kids and grandkids have done this. So you can, this is a great thing for kids to do. So if you have kids, you have grandkids, put them to work. You know, let them do this for you while you're at work. Uh, pay them a little bit to do this. You know, it, it's a little job. They can earn some spending money. You can hire neighborhood kids. You know, you have junior high or high school kids in your neighborhood and they want to earn a little money, you know, train them how to build your fences and, 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 and move the cattle. Again, you know, it, there, there's a whole host of solutions here to being able to get this done pretty effectively. And even if you have to pay somebody a little bit to move your cattle, it's still well worth it. The, the added income and benefits that you're gonna get from doing this far outweigh even having to pay somebody for an hour or two a day to help you out. Thanks, Alan. So just uh, time for one last quick question um, before we have to transition on. Um, and we will capture these questions that we weren't able to get to and apologize, we have run ourselves out of time. 
the last question is around uh, the use of a lead cow to move the herd. And is that something that uh, that is a common practice or something that you would recommend? Yes, yeah, so you can use lead cows or lead steers. Uh, you know, Dr. Gordon Hazard, when he was alive, uh, you know, he liked to use lead steers. And, uh, but yes, partic now, if you have a cow herd, yeah, then, then you don't need a lead cow because all your cows have done this for years and they know what to do. And, you know, and so you have multiple older cows always in the herd that are training the young ones and the younger ones will follow. However, if you're grazing uh, feeder steers or feeder heifers for grass finishing or you're grazing stalker cattle, yearlings, all of that, and you're getting in different batches every year and they don't know the rotations on your farm, that's where a lead cow or a lead steer can be invaluable. And I would highly recommend that. And if you're running several hundred to several thousand head of yearlings or stalkers on your farm, then I recommend a handful of lead cows in the mix. Uh, but they really are highly effective. They know where to go and they can train up a set of young newbie cattle very, very quickly. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. Uh, that is all the time we have for questions. So, uh, like I said, we'll get back to these questions that weren't answered offline, but we do thank everyone for uh, submitting them. And thanks to you, Alan, for answering those questions. Wanted to just uh, once again say thank you. Also, provide some contact information uh, pastureproject.org. You can get in touch with us. Uh, my email there, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to me, and I am happy to help in any way that I can. Uh, and Alan has his email there at the bottom as well. So uh, feel free to reach out with him, uh, reach out to him uh, with any additional questions. Uh, so with that, have a good evening. And once again, thanks for joining the webinar.